I'll begin with a word of prayer. Um, Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students and this time we have just to uh, study your creation, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, I am struggling uh, to uh, leave Rotman because I, I, I love reading Rotman very, very much, and it's hard for me to leave that book. I, on the way to school, part of the reason I'm late is I spent a minute like putting this in my bag and then I'm pulling it out, putting the Modern Algebra Foundation, you know, the Rotman's Modern Algebra, and I'm like, no, I, this is our book. You must use this book. Ah, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, but I, I forced myself. I mean, this is a good book. <laughs> so, it has almost everything we need in it. Um, so I wanted to <clears throat> pick up a couple pieces that we missed. Not too, it won't take maybe five minutes, probably here. Um, proposition, proposition one, this is from section 10.1 in Dummett and Foot. And proposition one, it's kind of important. It's the submodule criterion. It says this: Let R be a ring. And <clears throat> M in R module. Um, a left R module, right? A subset. subset N of M is a submodule of M if and only if what? This should look familiar. One, N is not the empty set. So N is not empty. And two, what do you think? x plus ry is an element of n um, for all r and r and x, y, and n. <coughs> all right, so there is a generalization of the subspace test. Now, one of the things that we're going to struggle with over the next few lectures is coming to terms with how linear algebra is damaged by replacing the field with a ring. I mean, sometimes you get this sense that everything's okay. Look, it's our happy place. This is the subspace test, right? So why do we even need to study this? We've already studied linear algebra, so we already know modules. Well, no. All of a sudden, the you know floor will be pulled out from under us, and bad things will happen. Ah, uh, her meet normal form. That'll be. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a ways off. T talking about what? Um, I had an unresolved confusion from the illustrator. Ah. Oh, okay. Yes, Dr. Smith um, does. Um, I mean, he should champion the Smith normal form, really. But um, I guess he's too modest. No, not really. Not at his. Smith of Smith normal form has been has been gone for a while, I think. Um, anyway, so let uh, we'll get to that though. That's gonna be a little bit. Let R be a commutative ring. Um, with identity. All right. Then an R algebra. And our algebra is a ring A, right, with an identity with identity together um, with a ring homomorphism. Ring homomorphism F from R to A. Um, and let's say that the identity in 
and it's one one sub a, right? This is one sub r with we need the f of one r is equal to one a. You got to understand, um, depending on which book you have studied abstract algebra from, from you may or may not be uh, inculcated with the idea that the ring homomorphism sends one to one. If you've been working with rings without identity, then you wouldn't make that part of your ring homomorphism, you know, structure. Of course, you did because we worked with rings with identity. Yeah. Now, um, such that what? Here's the kicker: that the subring f of r, right? The subring f of r is contained in the center of A. So this is in, in our algebra, or a, or algebra, as only I say. Um, you can talk about A and B being two R algebras, and then in R algebra, isomorphism or homomorphism is a, homo, a ring homomorphism or isomorphism which maps one to one, and for which you know you have phi of R A equals R phi of A. This would make phi from A to B in R algebra homomorphism. So this is something that was missing from our discussion so far as a definition of what, an, what is an algebra, right? So this is, so he gives some examples on page 343, which I'll just read rather than write. Um, he says, any ring with identity is itself a, a Z algebra, right? So we can, so, you know, what is this? I mean, well, I think he'll say in a second here, so I'll just read along here. Um, any ring A with identity, if R is the subring, if R is a subring which is the center of, it, uh, excuse me, if R is a subring of the center of A containing the identity of A, then, then A is in our algebra. In particular, a commutative ring A containing one is in our algebra. For any subring, um, any subring R of A containing one. For example, the polynomial ring. Um, over a commutative ring is in our algebra. And the polynomial ring R over any number of variables is in our algebra. The group ring, RG for a finite group, is in our algebra. So those are probably worth writing on the board. For our commutative. Some examples of our algebra's polynomials polynomials in as many variables as you like, right? And the very important group algebra, RG. How do we define the group algebra for a finite group? Um, you know, this is R1, G1 plus R2, G2, RK, GK, such that G is equal to G1. GK. So the group algebra is just the set of, uh, you know, linear combinations, R linear combinations um, from a group. And we're talking about a finite group. So this is, this is a group algebra. Yeah. How do you... <coughs> Right. Um, let's see here. The R module structure is defined by um, R of A, R times A equals A times R equals F of R times A. He says R times A is equal to A times R is equal to F of R times A is the definition of um, scale. That's the definition. That, that gives A an R module structure. Very good question, King. 
So this is, I'm reading from page 342, the paragraph at the bottom of the page. He you know, has details right there. But. I, I found that we need to have like entries. Maybe check it. Yeah, I was, I was thinking the same thing myself. Um, but no, we don't, we, don't need, uh, we don't necessarily need an injection here. Um, but I will admit, for my own thinking, I personally, when I think of an R algebra, I do think of a, I think of some sort of ring which actually has a copy, uh, injectively, I guess you could say, embedded into the algebra in the center. Like there's there's a copy of the ring in there, and you can multiply elements of your algebra by the ring. But I'm really so. What is that? I mean, if the ring is a field, right? I mean, and another example of this would be if the ring is a field, right? And if we have a vector space over the field paired with what? Multiplication. So, you know, something like multiplication goes from the Cartesian product of the vector space back to itself again. Um, I mean, that's, to me, I, that's, that, when I think of an algebra, this is what I think of. I think of a vector space paired with a multiplication. So the definition which is given in Dumb and Foot here in terms of, you know, what I just wrote, I, I, it's sort of a more, I, think, I guess it's a more basic definition um, because we're not assuming a field, right? But a lot of times when people talk about an algebra, they're talking about this, a vector space paired with some multiplication where the multiplication satisfies reasonable requirements, usually you have assumption that the multiplication is bilinear, right? That you have rules like, you know, x plus y star z and x star y plus z. And when you've got a scalar c, right, you know what happens. You could all tell me the formula I'm about to write down, even though I haven't written it down yet, right? Because this structure is just familiar. So this is usually one of the one of the base assumptions of what it means to have a vector space, which has an algebra structure, is to add uh, a multiplication which respects the dis natural distributivity coming from the vector addition and scalar multiplication. And then past that, you can add extra bells and whistles. Like, it could be a commutative algebra. That would be x star y is y star x, right? Um, it could be an associative algebra, which would be that, you know. Yeah, the complexes are real algebra, quaternions are a real algebra. Uh, I think we can even say quaternions are a complex algebra, right? In which definition? I mean, the ring has to be associated. Oh, good point. So this is actually both more and less general than what I wrote for four. So are the Arctonians hmm. associated? Like, would the Arctonians fall under this definition? Yeah, so I think, I think the Arctonians and Right, so that it seems like those would fall under this vector space definition of algebra that I'm giving. So I shouldn't really call this four. I should call this uh, definition two. Algebra based over vector space concept. <laughs> and uh, hmm. see, now I'm a little worried as to exactly the story of how this all goes together. I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask my, uh, I'm going to phone a friend later and see if I can find anything useful to add this to the discussion rather than us um, debating it here at the moment. Um, his example three on page 343 is that if A is an R algebra, then the R module structure of A depends only on the subring F of R contained in the center of A as in the previous example. If we replace R with its image, F of R, we, say that we see that up to a ring homomorphism, 
every algebra A arises from a subring of the center of A that contains one A. Um, and then, well, actually, four is the case when R is a field. Um, so basically, he says that an algebra over a field is the same as saying that the ring A contains the field in its center and the identity of A and F are the same. Right. But as you, and I'm very, so happy that you point this out. We assume associativity of the ring multiplication, which means that non-associative algebras can't find a home in this definition. And non-associative algebras are, inter are, are, are interesting. Not all algebras that are interesting are, 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 are associative. For example, if you, pad to, if you add to these, um, <clears throat> well, usually we use the notation um, x star y equals to x comma y for the so-called Lie bracket. I mean, that's a, that's a particular kind of multiplication of a vector space, which is in all sorts of applications and really can't be avoided as a student of pure math in graduate school. Like, you need to study the algebras. They're, they just appear. And um, I mean, you find this structure in studying differential operators over functions, right? So you could be an analyst and still have to face this. Um, and that Lie bracket is not associative. And in fact, the associativity, um, well, the lack of associativity is, well, it's kind of, um, what's the word? Tamed, if you will. So the bracket satisfies this identity called the Jacobi identity. And that Jacobi identity ba basically measures the, the, fail, the, you know, the fall from associativity. For example, if you take R3 paired with the cross product, this is a Lie algebra. All right. Anyway. <clears throat> so, all right. So next up, um, I would point out that theorem 6 in section 6 and section 10.3 is a stupidly general um, generalization of one of my favorite theorems from linear algebra. Let's see if you can tell me what it is. Here it is. For any set A, any set A, there exists free module. F A, F of A, on the set A, and F A satisfies the following universal property. All right, and here's what that means. If M is any R module, all right, and phi from A to M is any map, all right, of sets, well, what else would you map? Well, anyway, <laughs> a map of sets. Um, then there exists a unique, there exists a unique R module homomorphism. Um, big V, big V from the free module generated by A, F A to M, such that, oh, so much writing, big V of A is equal to little phi of A for all A and A, thus the following diagram commutes, A inclusion F A um, V 
phi, little phi, m. Now, I have not taken the time and energy to define what the free module generated by A is in here. But that is explained in, cruci in excruciating detail in Dummett and Foot if you read chapter 10. It's in there. But the most important example, well, I, an easy example to understand for f of, you know, f, f of A is the case where A is finite. All right. When A is a finite set, say A1, A2, da da da, AN, all right, so finite. Then F of A is what? It's things of the form. Well, we can write it this way RA1, direct sum. RA2, direct sum, da da da, direct sum, RAN. In other words, up to isomorphism, it's n tuples of the ring. It's RN. This is what it means for a module to be free. A free module is one which is isomorphic to um, just a direct product of the underlying ring for the module. If it's not the case that it's isomorphic to a direct, you know, to a direct, just like the Cartesian product of the underlying ring, then it's not a free module. Right? That other kind of thing that's out there we call torsion. We'll be getting into that in more detail um, later. Okay. So can, um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not even going to uh, go through the proof of it. The proof of it is given in careful, um, you know, detail, 354 to 355. But what is this theorem I just wrote down? Can you can you can you recognize it? In linear, what is this in linear? Yes, fair enough. In in linear algebra, you, you should know my home is linear algebra. Right. This is the basis extension theorem. Right. Or in abstract algebra, it's the what? It's analogous to the, if we have a generating set, if we have two homomorphisms defined in a generating set, then equality in a generating set extends to equality everywhere, or something like that. Um, and so I, you know, this, this commutes, it's a commuting diagram, what's that mean? So that, that should mean that phi is equal to what? I can either go like this, or I can go like that, right? Stupid Yoda. I, it's the most unsatisfying letter to write in the whole mathematical lexicon all I can do to not, I just really, really want to do that. <laughs> but it's not, it's not there. It's not there. OK, so that is, of course, an important theorem. That brings us to section 10.4, which is on tensor products of modules. All right. Now, last year, I probably spent five days on this section. And at the end of it all, I was like, well, that was dumb. Maybe a day or two would have done just as well. And the thing is, is I got sucked into doing the start of the section in class. The start of the section is just a special case of the more general construction, which happens midway through the section. So I'm just going to go straight to the general construction, because it's almost verbatim the same thing. So the start of the section basically just describes how you can sort of just level up the scalars. Um, how you can, you know, change the set of scalars for the module in some sense by, by this construction. Um, but I, 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 I kind of, I just rather start in the middle, and I, I think it, I think it's good. So let me just get to it. First of all, let me describe what we're trying to do. 
what's the, you know, what's the program? What's the, uh, what's the goal here? What's the problem? Um, the problem is describing essentially how, how would you, how would you multiply? So here's the, here's basically the question. Given modules M and N, how to multiply M and M with N and N. That's essentially the, the question that's asked and, and answered by this section. Yeah. Oh, what's wrong with me? Many things, but there you go. So we're going to give meaning to that in this section by saying, well, we'll multiply them to get, we'll get m tensor n. Right. We're going to describe carefully what's meant by m tensor n in this context. Then hopefully soon, I will transition over to a later chapter where we talk about the tensor algebra of a given module. And there we talk about how to multiply m by itself as many times as we like and basically look at, in some sense, an infinite series. The tensor algebra is, it goes on and on. You can look at the ring, the module, basically products of the module with itself, products of the module with itself, with itself, with itself, products of the module with itself, with itself, with itself, with itself, and a direct sum of that forever and ever. Amen. And, and you just work with the direct sum of all these things so you can have them all. It would be like allowing yourself to add matrices of different size. And some, I mean, that's, it's not the same thing, but it would be something similar. Like, who says you can't add? two by two and three by five matrices, right? You just pick the larger size matrix and add zeros to the other one and then you add them. Then you've got a new matrix which is based on the original two in a meaningful way which will satisfy many of the axioms that you'd like, right? But then it forbids you a very satisfying question to ask undergraduate linear algebra students which is can you do this? And the answer is no. But that U is contingent upon it being a undergraduate linear algebra class. See, if you had a better class, they would always say, yes, I would just add zeros. That's a meaningful way of adding these matrices. But no one ever says this. They just say yes or no, and I tell them that they're wrong when they say no, and they believe me. It's an opportunity. <laughs> opportunity to teach about type theory, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so <clears throat> let me just tell you the construction here. So. Um, essentially, what we do is, now, for, for technical reasons, and so he, he has, again, there's, Dumbin Foot often does this, he has sort of a transitory, slightly more general construction, which then later he admits, then he's like, but most applications have this special case. So eventually, let's see here, he... Well, we'll get to it next time, but I'm just saying that this is not the, the, uh, you know, the final thought here either. Um, because at the moment, we need n, here's the data we need, n a left R module, all right, m a right R module. All right. Then here's the, the 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 entering construction. We can identify that M Cartesian product with N is naturally then a what? It's a Z module, right? In the sense that if we have you know K times M comma N, what is it? Km, Kn, right? For any integer. In other words, we add and subtract copies component-wise, right? We know how to take the Cartesian product of two abelian groups and 
get an abelian group. M and N are separately abelian groups, right? So the Cartesian product's an abelian group. And what does that mean? That means that any quotient is defined. If we take the quotient by any subgroup, it's defined. So what you do is you let, um, I, 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 this is not even, I don't think it's even named, but um, let's call it um, Pac-Man. There we go. So um, Pac-Man is a subgroup of M cross N generated by relations. What relations should it be generated by? Well, here they are. First of all, we want M1 plus M2 comma N, all right, minus M1 comma N minus M2 comma N. We want that to be one of our relations, all right. We, we call that R1, just to give it a name. We want relation 2 to be, um, let's say, you know, M, M comma N1 plus N2. You guys tell me what we're going to do. Subtract what? M comma N1, M comma N2, right? So we're defining Pac-Man essentially as the kernel of these equations, right? Yeah, I mean, you could you could define Pac-Man. Pac-Man is kernel of beta, where beta of m comma n. Well, let me just write it this way: beta is equal to relation one, comma relation two, comma as many relations as we need, right? And saying that we're in the kernel of that is to say that they're simultaneously zero. But the kernel, of course, is a subgroup. Not surprisingly, a normal subgroup, because all subgroups are normal because we're in an abelian group. But anyway. Yeah. But it's abelian, so every subgroup is normal. But anyway, yes. R3. Um, but you got to realize that I'm labeling these. I mean, that's not quite accurate either, right? Because is this, I mean, well, that was fine, but what I'm about to write is not just one thing, is it? R3 is um, MR comma N minus M comma RN. And you want that to be, you know, in fact, you want these to hold for all M, M1, M2, N1, N2, M, and N, and R, right? So, I mean, this, this, is, this is too simplistic. It's not quite this, right? I should stick with my, the subgroup generated by the relations, right? Um, <clears throat> And this quotient, all right, is denoted M tensor N. What's that? Just a group? What? Oh, no, it will have structure. We haven't described it yet, but yes, M, M tensor N, or as it's sometimes denoted, M tensor R N, will be just the Cartesian product quotient back N. Right. And so notation, notation, Little m tensor little n is an element of m tensor n. So that's actually a coset. I mean, this, to be more specific, m tensor n is coset in m cross n 
mod pack man containing representative m comma n. And so, yeah, up to this point, it's really just Z module stuff, right? This is not, there's nothing. I mean, I said, well, this here doesn't exactly feel like a Z module statement, but up to this point, I've only defined the, the tensor product as a Z module, right? Then the question is, how do you go, how do you continue here? Um, let's see here. He says, there's a little discussion here I probably should not ignore. Uh, he says, a mapping, mapping m cross n to the free module on m cross n and then passing to the quotient defines a map. Oh, fine. Here, oh man, that again. Ah, I hate it. So this actually has a name. Ah. So this uh, Yoda is a mapping from the Cartesian product MN, of course, to this guy, right? He said this map, he says this map is not, is in general not a group homomorphism, but it is additive in both M and N separately, and it does satisfy the following property. So, Yoda of MR comma N is equal to MR tensor N, which is equal to m. Now, why can you do this right here? That step right there. What? How do I get away with that? Right here. The the inequality there. See, in the quotient, right? In the Pac-Man. What are these, I mean, you know how the quotient works, right? The essential point is that we get to set these things equal to zero, right? So these become zero in the quotient. And so what these things actually say, what, what does this translate into as it, you know, when you interpret this in terms of the tensor notation, this says, for example, M1 plus M2 tensor N is equal to what? M1 tensor N plus M2 tensor N, right? The second one says that M1, ten, M rather, tensor N1 plus N2 is M tensor N1 plus M tensor N2. And of course the last one says that uh, MR tensor N is M tensor RN. Right? And that's why it's a this is why it's tensor sub r, because you're allowed to transport r scalars through the tensor. Right? I mean, you could conceivably be working with a point set which has both the module structure of the reals and, and the complex. And if you're dealing with the, the, um, if you're dealing with the tensor over the reals, you would not be allowed to just willy-nilly bring complex scalars in and out of the tensor like that. So the, the, the base ring of the tensor product matters in terms of the calculations which are allowed. We're not allowed. Wait a minute, same thing. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this, he says, this, this map, the Yoda map, is an example of what's called an R-balanced or middle linear map. So a middle linear map is a mapping from M cross N to L, which is additive in both the M and the N slots. And it's middle linear because it's got one kind of linearity one way and it's got another kind of linearity the other way. In particular, you're allowed to, well, the, the, the basic thing about a middle linear map, I'm not going to write it all down because, well, you guys can read the book and it's a lot to write and it's not that interesting. So it's, it's additive in both slot entries. But the interesting thing, the really the middle linearity comes from what happens with, okay, so M was what? Uh, right R module, right? So I can write MR. And N is the left R module. So middle linear, the reason it's middle linear is because you can move the scalar in the middle. All right. And then, of course, the interesting thing about that 
is that there's an extremely useful universal property of the tensor product with respect to balanced maps. Theorem 10 tells you that you can, any homomorphism from the tensor product um, M and N over R to another, um, R, to another R module uniquely corresponds, in this, according to Theorem 10, to a middle linear map on the Cartesian product of M and N. So this theorem 10 tells you you can if you look at it if you look at a, if you can find a, a map from the Cartesian product of M and N to an R module, right? And that Cartesian product map has this middle linearity, then there's a unique um, corresponding map on the tensor product of M and N to the other R module. This is very useful because checking middle linearity of maps is pretty simple because the Cartesian product is nice. Right? You're not working with respect to a bunch of pesky relations. Right? So all you've got to check is like additivity in both slots and the middle linearity condition. If you were to try to prove things were directly um, R module homomorphic from the tensor product to another module, then you'd have to worry about all of this. Because the thing is, M tensor N is ambiguous. Right? thing is the tensor product for M and N is, is, is ambiguous. So I'm, I'm eager to give you a couple of examples. Let's skip ahead a bit. <clears throat> so yeah, eventually, ah, curses, I, I probably just don't have time today. All right, so at least, let me at least give you one example today in terms of interesting tensor product calculation. So like the definition on page 368, he has R a commutative ring, M and N both left R modules. And then he talks about an R bilinear map, right? Um, if it's R linear in each factor. And then his corollary 12, we have M and N two left R modules. We talk about the tensor product of two left R modules. And, and we give it a standard R module structure. Um, it makes the tensor product a left R module again. And um, again, we can, trans we can basically, we can get an R module homomorphism from studying a corresponding, if we can get bilinearity on the Cartesian product, we can get homomorphism on the tensor product. So that's, that's what we have to try to look more at next class. I'm just giving you a look ahead. I wanted to give you one example. Ah, I think these are somewhat, somewhat, uh, disturbing. <clears throat> so we still have some groundwork to do to really, you know, build up what I'm, what I'm calculating here. But uh, this is example two on page 368. So he looks at Z mod 2Z tensor over, the Z, over, over Z, Z mod 3Z. All right. Okay, so can you describe what this looks like? Well, he says if A is in Z mod 2Z, what do we can say about A? We can say that 3A is equal to A, right? And so we have the following. He says if we look at A tensor B, then that's what? That's 3A tensor B, right? Which is A tensor, what? 3B, which is A tensor 0, which is 0. And by the way, example one, which I'll do next time, shows you that the tensor of zero with anything is zero. That's one of the things that stems from this construction we're doing. And so what this shows you is that the tensor product of Z2, you know, Z mod 2 and Z mod 3 is just, it's trivial, yeah. So, um, Wow. 
well, anyway, in, in, in some sense, this is, I mean, if you look at the earlier part of this section, I think you could interpret this as you're trying to replace the, replace the scalars of this R module with this set of scalars in some sense. And this, this calculation basically shows you that if you do that and you still try to keep, keep Z3, Z3, you just you can't do it. There's, there's no meaningful way to use Z2 scalars in Z3. You just, no can do you know? Sorry. I've been watching too much How I Met Your Mother at Night. But anyway, all right. So that's the start. I just, I love this construction. It's so simple. I mean, this idea that you just divide by the relations you want, and that gives you the set where, you know, you can define the tensor. That's just it's beautiful, simple idea that uh, plays out again and again and as we study algebra. This is how we often construct things in terms of quotients and cosets, which is why we should spend a lot of time on the coset construction in Math 200. But anyway, I shut up.